afternoon and welcome to segment one of uh, Council Comments with Sasha Love Higgins. I am very excited today to be here at Cove Haven with none other than Yvonne Giles, who is our local historian and also so many things to so many people here in Lexington. Ms. Giles, thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So now tell us about Cove Haven. I'm so excited about this space. I love this area. I know that we've done a lot of work here and it is such a beautiful um, piece of the history that is Lexington. Mm -hmm. Please tell us more. Well, Cove Haven was founded or organized, the board organized in 1907. They opened in May 3rd, 1908 and accepted their first burial within that time period. So we're looking at a a cemetery that's well over a hundred years old. It is 16 acres, uh, first purchased in um, 1907 from the Bradley subdivision. It was a subdivision just outside the city limits. And wow. when they first purchased the 16 acres that we're standing on, they opened the upper portion of it, which are sections A, B, C. We're standing in section D. Okay. And they did not develop the rest of the property beyond the bridge until much later. Oh, wow. But yeah, it was, uh, and the front gate has all the original organizers on a plat uh, that, that one of their board members actually left money to have done. Wow. And I'm pleased to see so much work has been done recently in the cemetery. It's just, it's a beautiful place. It is a beautiful place. And you feel how rich the history is here? Oh, most definitely. Most of the uh, individuals who are here in the cemetery, most of them were former enslaved. Many of them were first generation from enslavement. And they became the entrepreneurs, the leaders, uh, the politicians, teachers, educators, doctors, lawyers that moved the black community ahead from enslavement into the mid-1920s. Jeez, I had no idea. Yeah. Wow. So now, is this the first cemetery that we have for African Americans here in Lexington? It or? is the second. I know it a lot of second. people okay. have asked that, but African Cemetery Number 2 over on East 7th Street was organized in 1869. So it was actually the first cemetery bought, owned, managed by blacks. This was the second, and interestingly, one of the organizers of this cemetery was a son of the organizer of African Cemetery Number Two. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Jordan Jackson Sr. was listed as a trustee on the deed for African Cemetery Number Two. Jordan Jackson Jr. was listed on the deed for the purchase of this particular cemetery. Wow. So now you also have a lot of veterans here and a lot of people, you yes. know, from military. Talk a little bit about that, please. Uh, when I did a survey of all the headstones in 2009, I found that there were over 430 veterans. They are identified with military markers from the Civil War all the way through the Gulf Wars. And the other interesting thing was that I found one um, headstone for a man who served in the Canadian military during World War I. Wow. And there are women here who've also been commemorated with uh, monuments for the military service, which is unusual. Yeah, and as you can see right now, we do have a funeral procession, so God bless the folks that are here um, going through this experience right now, but we are still burying people here, so that's really interesting and really cool. So, um, also, about the, uh, what's the oldest person that's been in, you know, do you think the oldest year someone is buried here I know 1809 was when... Okay, there are some uh, headstones that have dates that precede the development of this cemetery in okay. 1908. And what I have found in doing the research on those, those were bodies that were in African Cemetery Number 2. And they moved them here? They moved them here, yes. Uh, there are about four, two, two dozen or more headstones with dates that precede the cemetery. One of them is the Jordan Jackson Sr. that oh, I mentioned wow. earlier. Yes. He's just across the way from us and he died in 1876. Wow. But he has a marker in the family plot. So I know that he was over in our old cemetery. His mother was over in our old cemetery. There are some people in the section that we're standing in, they were in the old cemetery. And all of that can be documented. I've read uh, news articles that talk about the families that have moved their uh, loved ones from cemetery number two to Cove Haven. 
One was our first dentist, Dr. Dinwiddie, Thomas Oh, wow, Dinwiddie, the first African-American the dentist. The first African-American dentist here in, in Lexington. Lexington. In the whole state that's of Kentucky. That's amazing. In the whole state. whole state of Kentucky. Wow, that's amazing. And his headstone, uh, in his will, he left instruction for his executrist to move his headstone and all of his family members who were buried in number two, and that happened. Their headstones over here in this section. Well, and so he bought a family plot. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now talk a little bit about the family plots. How did that work exactly? Uh, usually, uh, an individual would contract with the cemetery to buy a family plot, and the plots were identified by corner markers, and the markers themselves will have a section, like at letter A, B, C, D, and a number, and they could be anywhere from a two person plot to a six person plot. So they were all identified by these corner markers. And that's where you were buried when you, uh, you know, when you had a deceased member. Mm -hmm. And the cemetery board uh, was a for-profit. It wasn't a non-profit organization. Oh, wow. It was for-profit. They voted for their trustees. They issued certificates. They issued bill of sales and they issued uh, burial permits. So you can read the burial permits that someone has uh, been placed in a plot that had already been purchased in number one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh my it goodness. It actually spells out exactly which lot or which plot of the lot they actually will be buried in. How much did that cost back then, do you know? Oh, cheap. <laughs> I'd imagine I think, so. Yeah, maybe seventy-five dollars. <laughs> wow, yeah. for a family plot. Yes, that's amazing. So it wasn't, you know, for then it wasn't cheap for yeah. them because it was, you know, our economy was different. Of course, early nineteen hundreds. Yes, I would imagine. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so very much for this. Well, thank you. So much for rich asking. history. Absolutely, we are so grateful to have your presence here thank and to you. have you share and bask in this moment and this opportunity to talk a little bit about. Cove Haven and some of the other rich pieces that make up the bluegrass and make up Lexington. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a privilege and honor. Thank you so much for all of your hard work, all your dedication yes. to um, keeping us thriving and to keep the information still relevant and alive. Well, and I well. appreciate your recognition. Yes, thank, thank you. you. So um, after this, we will uh, be having another great, exciting conversation with Officer Ryan Holland, who is our community officer, and he's been working on this Cove Haven project for quite some time. I think he's taken over a lot of the responsibility you were working on previously. Thank and you. And the baton <laughs> has been tossed over to this wonderful gentleman. So wonderful. can't wait to uh, introduce you to him and talk about some other fun stuff over here. So thank you again, and we'll be back soon. Welcome back to another segment of uh, Council Comments. We are so excited to be here with Officer Ryan Holland, who is our community officer for the 2nd District and this area. And one of his major projects is Cove Haven. So thank you so much for being here, Officer Holland. This Thanks is a pleasure me. to have you. You are absolutely phenomenal, and the work that you've done here, along with the work that Ms. Giles has done here in the, few, in the past, has been nothing um, short of spectacular. Thank Please you. tell us about what you've done and everything. Well, when I first became a neighborhood resource officer, you know, you drive through here every day and you see that the damage that has been done, um, and while we were planning uh, to start doing repairs, someone had, uh, was intoxicated and drove into the fence and caused more damage. So. Uh, we started planning to originally just redo the fence and try to do the front entrance, uh, but then uh, I found out that there was so many veterans that were buried here. So being a veteran myself, I wanted to take on to, to try to get it cleaned up and get it prepared, get the headstones cleaned for the Veterans Day event that NAVVETS has every year. So um, it's been a slow process, but we've had a lot of help from the community with businesses as well as uh, just people from the neighborhood and from the community that's come out and helped do cleanup. So it's a continuous project that we're still working on. There's a couple of bigger things to get done, but uh, the front entrance is done now. We've redone the fence, put a new gate in, um, redone the brick columns, the center focal point planter has been redone. So some of the things that uh, we're still working on is towards the rear of the cemetery that will hopefully get done in the next couple of months. Yeah, it really looks phenomenal, super Thank amazing. Yeah. Everything is so beautiful and you've done such a great job. Um, and so being that you were a veteran yourself, thank you for your service, by thank the you. way, um, that led uh, a very passionate desire right. to be able to help recreate this cemetery and help mm. bring it back to its former glory. Right. Um, so what about the buy-in from other veterans? Have you seen that? Have you had other groups that have come and We've partake? Had tons of veterans come out. We've had, uh, besides the companies that's come out, there's been motorcycle groups and other organizations from the community that's contacted me and actually come out and done some work on their own. Uh, basically, they just 
call me and say, hey, we want to do some work, and I kind of let them know where we're at in the project and what needs to be done, and they come out and take care of it, and I just worry about the cleanup part of it. Yeah, so it you makes, know. It makes the project, and that's what I wanted it to happen was the community to take over the project because once I'm gone and move on or we're done with the bigger parts of the project, it's going to take the community to, to upkeep what we've done. To yeah. Keep it. I think you've really created a buy-in. Um, I remember uh, over the summer, uh, we jumped in and we came out to help you. It was right. like, I, I came with my kids and my husband and there were so many other families right. here. You had your own family here right. and we we're scrubbing down tombstones. I thought that was so cool. And to see and feel the energy of all the folks that were a part of this, um, you know, reach and the desire to make this right. place better. I think it was phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, what other suggestions do you have to create that sense of camaraderie and pull people together for the future? I mean, it's just, it just takes one person to say yes to something that needs to be done. And when you have that one yes, I mean, that's what I took on. I said, yes, I'll do this. This is something I want to do. And to go around and just ask other people to reach out, use social media, network as much as you can with friends and family, and you find people that want to be part of something. And that's, that's what it is. It's the community coming together and working together. No matter where we come from, where we live in, what life choices we've made, we can put all those aside and we can come together and get something done that's good but you can you know people have brought their kids out here they learn something they yeah. learn the sacrifices that some of these veterans made all the way back to the Spanish American War and and that learn something that teaches your kids to give back to the community and that's what we need yeah I think you are really um, you know the epitome of a neighborhood officer you know a community well, officer you. were you like this as a child no I, I don't know. <laughs> Were you like out there? I mean, you know? I've always tried to serve. My family's always served. My dad was on the fire department for over 30 years. My brother's been a police officer. So, um, you know, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to serve my country and then come back and serve wow. the community that I live in. Service over self. It's been right. a part of you. Yes, ma'am. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Thank you so much again. Um, your biggest takeaway. What is your biggest takeaway from doing this project? Um, just uh, that it was a project to me in the beginning and then to see that the the different people that come out and have uh, race has been a big issue with some of the people in their lives and the stories that they tell me that coming out here and working with different people have broken, you know, 20 or 30, 40 years of how they were raised and wow. broken those ties of how they feel and it's changed them and it's changed my, my life and, and uh, my thought process of work and, and what I do. It's, it's really, it's protect and serve as a police officer, but this is the ser true service side of of doing it. Wow, absolutely. Thank you so much again. Thank you. You know, you and Miss Giles are phenomenal. Really appreciate you guys and all the folks that have worked on this project. Everyone from, um, you know, the folks at the uh, fire stations and the police and all the other service industries, the veterans, and all the community people jumping in. Thank you so much again. We truly appreciate what you've done here and we look forward to the future. We see a bright, shining opportunity to create and um, keep the history that is Lexington and we're excited for that. So thank you again and uh, we will see you another time on Council Comments with Sasha Love Higgins. Have a great rest of your day.